I'm asbestos attorney Justinian Lane. Thank you for tuning in today for part four of my video series, Asbestos 101. In part one, we covered what asbestos is, kind of the mineralogy of it. In part two, we covered what the uses of asbestos were in the modern age. And in part three, we covered the health risks of asbestos. So today we're going to talk about how the actual cover-up worked, how it was the asbestos industry was able to hide the dangers of their products for so many decades. So let's get into that now. Here's how the cover-up worked. They had to delay or suppress the release of information regarding the health risks of asbestos. You'll see some examples of how they did that. And then they had to work with corruptible experts to edit scientific studies to get their point of view across. And you'll see some examples of that in which people that were going to publish reputable studies made edits to these studies on behalf of the asbestos companies. And of course, for this to be a conspiracy, you had to collaborate with other companies in the industry to further that conspiracy. And you'll see a little bit about that today, the companies that funded some of the first scientific studies that were edited for the asbestos industry. And those studies were conducted in secret, which was a big part of this. They had to conduct everything on their own terms and make sure that nobody from the outside world knew what was going on. And then the last prong of the conspiracy, this was done out in the open, just the lobbying for uh, legislation that would protect industry, and they were typically against any bills that would protect workers. We see the same thing today. Corporate America trying to protect their interests does the same thing. But let's see how all this stuff began. The cover-up started to become necessary in May of 1929 when a woman named Anna Perskowski was a former Johns Manville employee, and she filed a lawsuit against Johns Manville for injuries that she sustained. Now, here is what her actual lawsuit looked like. You can kind of follow along here. It shows that the, uh, the plaintiff was in the employ of the defendant in Manville, New Jersey, at its plant starting in 1922, maybe a little bit before. You'll see it says that uh, her body became infected and weakened so as to cause her to suffer permanently with a malignant disease. Now, malignant today typically means cancer. It didn't in the context of 1929. They meant just a very bad disease, which would have been asbestosis. Here is, uh, on the next slide, the actual portion of the lawsuit where it states what Johns Manville did wrong. And this is very similar to what we would file in a lawsuit today, which would be failing to provide the plaintiff with a safe place to work, failing to provide the plaintiff with masks or other appliances, and failing to have a proper ventilation system. And at this time, the plaintiff was demanding the sum of $30,000. Uh, $30,000 in 1929 was quite a lot of money. It was, depending on the inflation calculators you, you could look at, it was at least several hundred thousand dollars of today's money. Now, this was the first lawsuit that was filed against Johns Manville by an employee, but it was not the last. Now, the attorney uh, named Samuel Greenstone filed a number of lawsuits against Johns Manville. And you can see the first one here was Ms. Perkowski's, Perskowski, I believe it's pronounced. And the last one was all the way down in 1932. So the total damages that Mr. Greenstone sought for his clients was $690,000, which in today's money is anywhere from 10 to 15 million, depending on which inflation calculator that you go with. Now, 1929 to 1932, it was a long time ago, but this, these events, as important as they were to Johns Manville, were not the most important events of the day. That would have been something else that happened in 1929, which was the stock market crash. And we've pulled out uh, a newspaper from the uh, Pittsburgh Press with some of the information about the, the, the crash that caused the Great Depression. Panic has wrecked the stock exchange, and New York is frenzied. New York is also where Johns Manville was headquartered. But notice that Mr. Greenstone was filing lawsuits very consistently, and then his last one in 1929 was filed October 9th, and the crash came on October 24th. Then there was a pause in the filing. Now, I can only surmise that the pause in the filing had to do with uh, the changing financial conditions both of the, the country and of Johns Manville as a whole. Let's look at this now. This is a, a chart that's pulled from a corporate history book published in the late 40s about Johns Manville. And you can see, I mean, this is a very bad trend line. It started to get a little bit better, but by 1932, Johns Manville was starting to be in some serious trouble. You can look at their net sales. In 1929, they're at $61 million. I don't know how much that is in today's money, but it's a lot. Then the next year, 1930, 49 million, down to 33 million, then $20 million. The company is just seeing its revenue crater. And in fact, they didn't exceed $61 million in revenue again until 1941, and that was only due to the war effort. So as you think about this cover-up that's going on, that's about to start, and you think about the millions of dollars of today's dollars of cases that are pending against the company, the Great Depression is going on, their revenue is, is just in bad shape. 
this is a big problem for the company because this is just a few of their employees that are suing. And they had thousands of employees. In 1929, they had uh, about 9,000 employees, but by 1933, they'd cut that down to about 5,000 employees. They're trimming costs. They're worried. The future of the company is at stake. So how does this go now? We've got these lawsuits that are pending against the company. They need to get them resolved. So what happens is in June 25th of 1933, Samuel Greenstone, the attorney who'd filed the cases, had sent a letter over to Johns Manville's corporate defense firm, and they made an offer to settle all of these cases confidentially. Not only would the settlement be confidential, which is very typical with settlements today against a big company, but there were some other tactics that Mr. Greenstone employed to get this settlement to go through. And that was he offered, not only will I keep this quiet, I will never sue Johns Manville again. I'll never help anyone else sue Johns Manville again either. So if you settle with me, no one has to know about these lawsuits or these settlements. Now, today, the American Bar Association has Rule 5.6, which is restrictions on rights to practice. And that precludes attorneys from entering into a settlement like that. So I could settle a case today confidentially for my clients, but I am not legally allowed to promise to never sue the defendant ever again. Now, that rule wasn't put in place because of what happened in these cases, but that in and of itself, these cases being settled in the manner they were, that's enough justification on its own to have this rule in place. Because if these cases hadn't been settled and Mr. Greenstone had publicized what had happened, the entire asbestos crisis may never have occurred because 1929, that was early enough for all of this information to have changed history and for the health effects for asbestos to be out in the public domain. So what happened on uh, on June 25th was we saw the letter earlier for Mr. Greenstone offering to settle those cases confidentially. Well, literally the same day of that letter, John's Manville uh, executive board met in the office of the president to discuss this settlement. And we have a picture here for you of this was a 1930s era picture of the corner of the headquarters where John's Manville was. So you see the little corner drugstore there. That was actually where John's Manville was headquartered. And at this time, John's Manville was the largest asbestos manufacturer in the world. Uh, they had mines uh, throughout the world, the very large one up in, uh, in Quebec. And most of the asbestos that was at least coming to the United States had John's Manville's fingerprint on it. So it's very important to understand their role in this. So people are going to gather in the board of, uh, for board of directors meeting to discuss settlement. And here are the minutes of that meeting. And it says that the settlement called for the payment of the total sum of $35,000, but only $10,000 was going to be paid immediately. The next $25,000 isn't going to be paid until July of 1934. So when I was first looking at these minutes, I had a couple of questions. Like, why didn't Johns Manville just pay the $35,000? Why did they have to delay this out a year? And why did they need director approval? Now, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I just want to bring it home. The reason that they had to do this with director approval and break apart the payments over a seven or eight month time span is Johns Manville is really hurting financially during the time. As you can see from this slide, this settlement amounted to 33% of the company's net income for all of 1933. That's a huge deal. Settlement worked out to be about $3,100 per person which is still a pretty big amount of money even today. That would still be well over uh, average person's salary for a year or two. But look at the bottom portion of this and put this into perspective. I wrote out that in 1932, Johns Manville and MetLife did a study and they found that 350 out of 1,100 workers at just one plant had developed asbestosis. Now, again, at this point, they had four or 5,000 employees that were hourly employees and most of them were working around asbestos. So they're looking at this thinking, gosh, a third, a fourth of our employees might have asbestosis. And that doesn't just cover current employees. That goes back. If people had worked for them 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Remember, Johns Manville started in the 1850s as a H.W. Johns Manufacturing Company. Had they let this information get public, the wave of lawsuits that likely would have followed could have crushed the company and put it out of business. Of course, that does not justify in any way, shape, or form the cover-up they did, but it explains this is not like Johns Manville and, and all of the other asbestos companies decided we want to sell a deadly product and kill people. Think about this. This is 1933. The disease asbestosis hadn't even been recognized for a full 10 years at this point. At first studies really identifying that came out in 1924 and then 1927. So for the 60 something years that Johns Manville had been selling asbestos, they didn't know anything was wrong. They only started to realize things were wrong 
at the absolute worst time for them to make that realization, which was the Great Depression beginning, the stock market crash. Had Johns Manville still been doing really well and been flush with money, maybe they would have done things differently. No one knows for certain, but we can tell that a big part of this started because they had to do something to save the company. They were trying to figure out how can we fix this dust problem? They understood the problem to be asbestos dust is in their factories. The workers are breathing it. They're getting sick. How can we solve that? And their thinking was, well, if we can just control the dust problem, then the product will be safe. So you'll see a whole lot of this conspiracy is them just trying to sweep the past away to protect the future. They were never able to figure out how to get the dust under enough control. And the reasons for that are kind of explained in part three about the health risks on just how small asbestos is and how difficult it would have been with 30s or 40s or 50s era technology to get particles that are so small, you could only see them with electron microscopes, which hadn't been invented yet. So this cover-up happened for two reasons. First, corporate greed. That's behind most cover-ups with companies. But second, a lack of the ability to recognize how to even fix it. They were trying to fix it and trying to buy themselves some time. Again, absolutely does not excuse the terrible actions of any of these people, but it at least explains it in a, a more nuanced and subtle way than just these were bad men doing bad things. It is a more complicated picture than that but they did do bad things. But we'll get back to what happened in the board of directors now. This group of gentlemen met and they decided, let's go ahead and settle these cases and do it confidentially. Every single person that you see on this screen bears responsibility for what happened in the asbestos crisis. And I wanna call out a couple of people individually. You see Vandiver Brown in the top right. He was the corporate attorney, the general counsel, or as he called himself at the time, the general attorney for Johns Manville. He later became the company's secretary, the officer position secretary, not like a receptionist secretary. He was a key figure in this cover-up, and he had his fingers in every single pie that had to do with covering up the dangers of asbestos. And in the bottom slide, we have George Whitney of J.P. Morgan and Enders Voorhees. Now, these guys especially had the opportunity to stop this crisis. George Whitney from J.P. Morgan. Well, J.P. Morgan was a huge bank then, just like it is today. Now, Johns Manville had originally been a family-owned company, but in 1927, J.P. Morgan took over the majority of shares, the family sold out, and then it was going to become a public company. So J.P. Morgan held Johns Manville's destiny in their hand for some period of time, but they also worked with pretty much every industrial company in the country at the time. Enders Voorhees, was a very smart gentleman who had an excellent career in industry. And he was so important that he left the employee of Johns Manville in the accounting department. He went over to U.S. Steel and they still had him be on their board of directors because he was such a valuable person for Johns Manville. Now, U.S. Steel was a huge corporation of its day as well. And here you've got Enders Voorhees going over to the steel industry, which every inch of a steel mill is just chock full of asbestos. They have to use tons of insulation. I have a number of clients that worked for U.S. steel mills throughout uh, the, the country, and they tell me about how they used asbestos blankets and insulation and all the places it was, and they were never warned about the dangers. Well, Enders Voorhees could have warned U.S. steel, and U.S. steel could have done things differently, but they chose not to. So remember these names and remember these faces and understand that these people who today are lauded as captains of industry were architects of a cover-up. The cover-up was done to advance what we in the legal profession, we call it the state-of-the-art defense. And what the state-of-the-art defense kind of means is that companies can't be presumed to have knowledge that hadn't been developed yet. A moment ago, I mentioned electron microscopes, and if they had had electron microscopes, they could have known A, B, and C. Well, we can't hold Johns Manville accountable for not having an electron microscope in 1933. A good way of explaining that was actually done by their corporate defense attorney in a letter to them. We have a letter sent on December 15th of 1934 from the defense attorney that settled those asbestosis cases to Vandiver Brown, the corporate attorney. And it said that one of our principal defenses and actions against the company on the common law theory of negligence has been that the scientific and medical knowledge has been insufficient until a very recent period to place upon the owners of plants or factories the burden or duty of taking special precautions against the possible onset of the disease to their employees. What he is saying here is 
We didn't have this knowledge until very recently, so courts can't hold us accountable. We can't be held accountable for something we didn't know. Uh, in one of the earlier videos, we talk about uh, Mr. Henry Ward Johns, the founder of Johns Manville. He himself died of asbestosis in 1899. Uh, pardon me, 1898. Now, we can't hold him accountable in any way. He didn't know, right? He had no idea this stuff was dangerous, so no one else in the company did. But Mr. Hobart here is writing to Mr. Brown explaining that as we get more knowledge, the law will put more duties and burdens upon us to protect our employees. In other words, knowledge of the hazard is the most important part of this conspiracy. What can they hide from their own knowledge? If they don't know it, they will not be held accountable for not knowing it. So the ways that they could control the, the, the flow of knowledge starts with suppression of information. So we'll talk about the ways that the asbestos companies suppressed knowledge of the dangers from asbestos from getting out. Before I jump into that though, we have to talk briefly a bit about silicosis and silica because some of the documents you're gonna see here shortly have a lot to do with silica and silicosis. That's relevant because silicosis had been discovered a long time before asbestosis, and there had already been a lot of lawsuits for individuals who were injured or killed by silica developing silicosis. So asbestosis and silicosis and black lung from coal miners are all a type of pneumoconiosis. Pneumoconiosis is caused by breathing dust. All pneumoconiosis is not asbestosis, but all asbe asbestosis is pneumoconiosis. Now, in May of 1932, a gentleman named Dr. Anthony Lanza, who was one of the medical doctors working for the Metropolitan Life, uh, Life Insurance Company out of uh, New York City, had been working with a lot of companies around the country to insure their workers for uh, group life insurance policies, health insurance, things like that. And he'd worked with a lot of companies that had been getting sued for their silica exposure. Now, here he is writing to Vanderver Brown. As you were probably aware, there are a great many suits being filed I have had several attorneys and other interest people, that's his misspelling, come to me for such advice as I could give them. So industry knows Dr. Lanza is a sympathetic figure that they can come to for help. He testifies on their behalf and he does things that he can to keep the business's fat out of the fire. That's part of what he does. Now he says that I have always refrained from mentioning the Johns Manville Company or anybody connected with it in any way. Now at this time in 1932, asbestosis, not been a lot of lawsuits. You saw on the slide, by that point, uh, Samuel Greenstone had had the only suits filed. Johns Manville was the largest asbestos company in the world. Nobody was targeting them for these lawsuits. And Mr. Lanza, Dr. Lanza, was helping to try to keep it that way. But he says that, I'm wondering if there might be some advantage in a community of interests, so to speak, for after all, misery loves company. What he means by that is, hey, you and the silica companies should get together and you should talk. Silicosis is a pneumoconiosis. Asbestosis is a pneumoconiosis. Maybe you guys can all come together and figure out something to do. At some point, they do. We'll talk about that later on, but not quite yet in 1932. So this report is coming out of Missouri and has to do with the experience there of the silica industry. And they're talking here, it says silicosis claims in gold mining alone costs $1 for every $5 of gold production. Suits totaling over $30 million, and this is 1934 money, so that's a lot of money. $30 million worth of lawsuits, silicosis lawsuits, have been brought up in the state of New York in just the last year. Now remember, in this time, in the 1930s, Johns Manville's total sales, not their profit, everything they sold, is less than this $30 million dollars that could wreck the industry. Now, at the bottom it says, the employers are bewildered and do not know what to do. The disease has been recognized for 20 years, but there's no known cure at the present date. And it continues, the epidemic of lawsuits is induced in part by the growing realization among the workers of the silicosis menace, and in part by the legal racketeers who have been stirring up trade on a contingent fee basis by getting the workmen to lodge complaints against their employers. A lot to talk about here. This epidemic of lawsuits was caused, in their view, because lawyers are trying to get business. Forget about all the workers that are breathing at silica and dying. The only reason they're suing is because of these, these evil lawyers. There's a lot of, in all these documents, they hate lawyers who work on a contingency fee basis. 
If you don't know what that is, it's it's how my law firm and pretty much every plaintiff's law firm gets paid. We get a percentage of anything that we are able to recover for the client. If we recover nothing, they owe us nothing. Now, that is an, a particularly appealing thing for most clients because otherwise they couldn't afford to hire attorneys. The last trial that my law firm was involved in cost us about $400,000 out of pocket from the day we started representing the client until the day that we went to trial. Don't even worry about an hourly billing rate. Most people don't have $400,000 lying around just to hire the expert witnesses and do the other costs of a lawsuit. So when you see in these documents later in, in this presentation and on our website, any time that a, a, especially a defense attorney is complaining about contingency fees, that's them saying we want to take away the keys to the courthouse. If we can get rid of contingency fee agreements, no one will be able to hire an attorney. Now, this document, this report on silicosis is stored in our internal database that we call Ward. We've named that after Ward Stevenson, who, as you see in one of the other video segments, was the attorney who filed the very first uh, mesothelioma lawsuits that started turning the tide against the asbestos companies. Now, in our database we call Ward, we have millions of pages of documents, and I've looked through a lot of them, and I cannot remember a single document in there where it's a board of directors minutes meeting where somebody's saying, geez, our workers are really sick and we're worried about it. It's always, we're really concerned about the financial effect that these sick workers are going to have on us. This period of time, now this is the mid-1930s, this is the Great Depression, and most industrial employers that spoke about it at the time kind of had an attitude like, these workers should just be happy they have a job. And a lot of them were, again, it's the Great Depression. You've, you've seen and heard about how terrible that time was. But they had kind of a, a complex that who are these people to be questioning what we're doing when we're putting food on the table for their family? And if you go and you visit our website at asbestosclaims.law and go and look through our database, you'll find these sentiments. They will be all sprinkled throughout the documents, especially in the 30s and the 40s. It's even stronger than it is in the later documents. And I want to point out at the bottom here, because I was confused when I first got into asbestos litigation. Why is this Dr. Lanza of MetLife doing all of these terrible things to conceal these, these damages? And then I understood MetLife is on the hook to pay for a lot of the damages that these lawsuits will cause. So while they're going out there and, and, and putting on a public face of we're this do-gooder do insurance company that cares about people, they really cared about their bottom line and they were totally fine with doctoring uh, scientific evidence to protect their bottom line as well as the bottom lines of the companies that they worked for. So with that silica background on this report, we can look at some correspondence that was going on at the time of, of interested parties. Now this letter was sent in January of 1933 to a gentleman, uh, Mr. Donald Cummings of the Saranac Laboratory for the study of tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is going to come up quite a bit in this presentation. And while today no one really thinks about tuberculosis in any meaningful way, this was an epidemic of its time that was killing about 80,000 people a year. So industry, uh, medical industry was very focused on how do we cure tuberculosis? How do we solve these problems? And they had this laboratory called the Saranac Laboratory for the study of tuberculosis, where they did a lot of groundbreaking work there. And in this letter, we got a letter that's from the zinc and lead industry, one of their lobbying groups, had commissioned some studies to try to figure out some of the hazards relating to silica in their mining operations. And the report comes out, Dr. Or Mr. Cummings had done this, he wasn't a doctor at the time, and had written a, a report that kind of indicts the uh, silica industry for the problems of, their, of silica. It's getting people sick. So the industry doesn't want this to come out, and they write, the possibilities of its very damaging use in the hands of some unscrupulous lawyers or others who might be interested in stirring up damage suits against the mining companies is extremely great at this time. In view of the above, the board expresses its firm objection to the publication of your paper, although it fully appreciates the scientific value of your studies. So they're telling them, hey, we know this paper is, is, is good. It's not bad work product, but we can't let you publish it because then lawyers are going to use it against us. It's nothing unscrupulous about using a scientific paper that was commissioned by the industry to use it against the industry themselves. They just don't want to pay for that to happen. So they vetoed this study's publication. Now, Donald Cummings was not really happy about this because he put a lot of work into this study and was very proud of it and wanted to get it published. So he's communicating with Dr. Lanza from MetLife in this letter, April 11th of 1933. But Mr. Uh, Dr. Lanza is writing back to, to Donald Cummings and he says, 
I topped it over with Sayers. Sayers, you'll hear learn about in another video, is a very reputable doctor at the time that's working on all of these industries' uh, problems too, with the dust control and the causes of these sicknesses. So I talked it over with Sayers, and he feels very strongly that if you and the Saranac Laboratory are going to stay in the consulting business with respect to the mining industry, it will not be possible for you to publish these papers, at least at the present time. I myself somewhat reluctantly feel inclined to agree with him. It's pretty obvious what they're telling him. If you go against industry, it's not going to go well for you. Saranac Labs will go out of business if you start publishing papers that your clients do not want published regardless of their scientific value to the world. Kind of sounds vaguely threatening, right? Well, it gets worse. Here we go. If these papers are published against the wishes of the Tri-State Association, you will undoubtedly promptly feel the repercussions elsewhere. As I said before, I feel the whole situation is unfortunate, but it's one of those things that can't not be helped. Promptly feel the repercussions elsewhere. What, what would that mean? Well, elsewhere means the entire industry that uses Saranac Labs. Saranac Labs is going to get blacklisted if they do this, if they start publishing information that the companies who hire them to do don't want published. Now, while this was a health organization that the, the, the laboratory itself was dedicated to health, it depended on funding from private industry to do its studies. In fact, and we'll be making a video about Saranac Labs, and I can show you that uh, just like teachers sometimes have to bring in their own supplies because they're underfunded, this laboratory was underfunded to the point that one of the doctors there is listed as one of the funding contributors in an annual report for contributing several hundred of his own dollars. And I've seen just letter after letter that the, the doctors working there had sent trying to get grants to, to perform some studies that were of very great importance to the world. But they were just broke and they couldn't get this stuff done. They were dependent upon industry. Industry fed them, and we all know not to bite the hand that feeds us. That's the lesson that Dr. Lanz is trying to teach Donald Cummings right here is, I know you want to do good. I know you're trying to make the world a better place, but you got to be more pragmatic about it. We can drag our feet and release this information when industry says it's okay, and that'll protect industry from lawsuits, which keeps all the money flowing. And the letter continues, we must recognize the present disturbed condition of affairs with the extraordinary multiplicity of damage suits for silicosis is not only very disturbing, but necessitates that all of us who are in contact with industrial firms proceed with a great deal of caution. I understand that shyster lawyers are beginning to stir things up in Pitcher and Miami, Miami, Oklahoma, which makes the situation with respect to the Tri-State Association still more difficult. Here's what he's saying. That area where you did the study, there's lawyers going into that, that area right now trying to get clients. You can't get this study out because this study is about the people that are filing the lawsuits. So we need to just bury that to protect this industry. The great deal of caution could also mean, hey, man, you and me, we're going to get called to testify. We can't have this. Bury this report. And of course, the reason we have to bury it is because of the shyster lawyers who God forbid, are trying to help get some compensation for the people that are getting sick and dying from silicosis. MetLife put their thumb on the scale and weighed in and said, you got to bury these. So that's what happened. Dr. Lanza continues. On the other hand, I feel fairly certain that when the industrial situation starts to clear up, and by clear up, he means when the lawsuit threat is over, you'll be able to bring your reports up to date and have them published. In that respect, as I pointed out, you are in the same position as we are with the investigations we've made in the asbestos industry. What exactly does Dr. Lanza mean? If you know much about Dr. Lanza at all, you'll know with respect to asbestos, he published a paper that was considered very authoritative at the time. It was published in uh, December of 34, wide, wide distribution in January of 35. Here's his paper, Effects on the Inhalation of Asbestos Dust on the Lungs of Asbestos Workers. What Lanza and MetLife did was go into a bunch of different asbestos companies' plants, including John's Manville, and they took surveys of the workers and they figured out what was going on. When I mentioned earlier that about a third of the workers at a plant that, that uh, JM had tested had showed signs of asbestosis, that was Dr. Lanza that did that. So by 1932, he could have published that. Oh, but Samuel o. Greenstone has these cases pending. We can't publish this because that would be really harmful and could launch this whole wave of lawsuits we don't want. The lawyers, the judges, the juries, they will see information that shows these lawsuits have merit. And those lawsuits, if they have merit, 
Well, we could bankrupt the silica industry. We could bankrupt any of the mining industries involved. Industry could go under. And MetLife collects premiums from these industries on their workers. So every month, the, the industry is paying money to MetLife to insure these workers. And if those premiums go up too high, MetLife will lose clients and they'll lose money. Or if they start having to start paying out these big verdicts, MetLife will lose money that way. So there's a lot of apple carts that are lined up that Dr. Lanza doesn't want to get upset by the pesky truth getting out. So for both the silica industry, uh, the lead mining industry, and the asbestos industry, Dr. Lanza and the Saranac Laboratory had developed a reputation amongst their benefactors. We're going to do good scientific work, and we're going to publish it just as soon as you say we're allowed to, and not one minute before. So after this whole correspondence chain between Cummings and Lanza, Dr. Lanza is writing to his boss, Dr. Knight, at MetLife headquarters. Dr. Knight is, is the vice president who Lanza reports to. And Lanza writes, on April 29th, Dr. Gardner and Mr. Cummings of Saranac Laboratory came to the home office for a conference with Sayers, McConnell, you, and myself. These are all key figures throughout the entire asbestos uh, story. Dr. Gardner, you hear a lot about at Saranac Labs. He ran a lot of the experiments, and he was an excellent scientist who was thwarted time after time to get this information out into the public. He really wanted this information about the health risks to be known. But industry and Dr. Lanza kept overruling him. So he writes about the meeting that happened, and he says that a very thorough discussion was had of all the various mutual interests amplified by the pieces of research being carried on at Saranac and at the Bureau of Mines Laboratories in Pittsburgh. Now, the various mutual interests we've talked a little about. MetLife has interest in not paying out uh, for any insurance policies, continuing to collect premiums from industry. Industry doesn't want to get sued into oblivion or have their insurance prices rise to the point that they can't afford them anymore. These various mutual interests, they're all financial. No one's talking about the health interests, about the workers who are working in these mines and who are getting sick and who are dying. So he says, in view of the very unusual condition of affairs obtaining in various parts of the country with respect to lawsuits for occupational diseases, and particularly the unsatisfactory condition in the Pitcher, Oklahoma district, what he means by unsatisfactory condition, he says this is a very dangerous place to work and people are going to keep getting sick there because the industry hasn't cleaned up. They're doing dirty stuff there. And by dirty, I mean that literally, dust. People are breathing bad things because the industry isn't cleaning up. So because the industry in pitcher is starting to get attention of lawsuits, it was agreed by all present that certain reports dealing with studies made in pitcher should not be published at this time, but the publication should be deferred until a more seasonable time. Again, very obvious what he means. Once all this lawsuit stuff is done, then we'll publish the scientific studies that will show that the people suing are really getting sick and dying, but not until then because it would cause too many problems. And to just drive that point home even further, it says the very last sentence, I enclose the expense accounts of Dr. Gardner and Mr. Cummings in connection with this trip. So MetLife paid to have these guys come out. Remember, you saw Cummings was writing back and forth to Lanza. We got to publish this report. We got to publish it. They fly them all out, probably put their arm around their shoulder. Come on, man. You got a long career ahead of you. Don't screw it up. We got to keep this going. You can envision that's what's going on in this 1933 meeting at the headquarters of MetLife. And Dr. Knight agreed with Dr. Lanza, we've got to bury this. So that's what they did. It was buried for a good period of time. And that's what they did in asbestos. So that's how they delayed reports. And that's just some of the delays. But now we can talk about corruption of scientific literature by very corruptible experts, people who just wanted to make some money and were willing to do whatever industry told them to do. We can see at this point now, it's December of 1934, and that report that I'd showed you earlier that Dr. Lanza delayed the effects of uh, asbestos on uh, asbestos workers, this is Dr. Lanza telling Vandiver Brown of Johns Manville, hey, I know we were ready a few years ago to publish this, but we really need to get this out now, so take a look at my draft of this, this very important study. What do you guys want? What do you think about it? Because Johns Manville had some of their workers were involved in this, that was some of the plants that were surveyed. So Johns Manville wanted to know what was going on. And uh, Vanderford Brown writes to Dr. Lanza, I've examined the galley proofs, that's the pre-publication copies of your preliminary study, and I am planning to transmit the proof sheets to Mr. Hobart so he'll receive them tomorrow and request that he return them to me no later than Thursday with his comments, and then I'll send you his comments. Do you remember the name Hobart, who he is? He's not a doctor. 
if we jump back, you remember from the Jones Manville Board of Directors meeting where they settled all those uh, asbestosis lawsuits? Hobart and Menard, George Hobart was the lawyer that settled those cases. Why on earth does their defense attorney need to give any input into a medical study? Well, we know why, because he wants to make sure that Johns Manville is protected. So we'll jump back now to uh, Vandiver Brown's letter. First issue he has is, you've omitted the first paragraph of your original 1931 report, we're years later now, this has been ready to go since 31. You've omitted the first paragraph, which said, during the progress of the study, physicians who were practicing in the communities where asbestos workers lived were questioned and stated they did not find an unusual amount of tuberculosis among these workers. The contrast between this state of affairs and that found in communities with a silicosis hazard is noteworthy. Why did this tuberculosis thing have to get inserted in, into an asbestos report? Done a lot of digging, and I think I have the answer here. Now, we talked about Samuel Greenstone's 11 cases that were filed against Johns Manville. There's another case. The case was the Alexander Ososki, as I believe how it's pronounced case. And that is September 12th of 1933, a different lawyer, an attorney named Isidore Klenert, filed suit against JM on behalf of Mr. Ososki and wanted $250,000. Hobart and Menard represented JM in this case, and it was settled. Well, what were the allegations of this lawsuit? That by reasons of Johns Manville's negligence, that the plaintiff contracted active pulmonary tuberculosis of both lungs. So at this point in 1933, before Lanza's study is published, there is a lawsuit filed and possibly still pending at this date against Johns Manville alleging, hey, I worked with your asbestos and your asbestos gave me tuberculosis. Again, tuberculosis was a huge problem in this day. It killed 80,000 people a year. It was a big deal. And the asbestos industry was terrified oh my God, Can if you breathe asbestos, are you more predisposed to get tuberculosis? If that's the case, we're in really bad shape because we get a lot of workers who have tuberculosis and how could we ever prove that it wasn't our asbestos exposure that got them that tuberculosis? Put it in perspective now. It took years for them, JM to settle Greenstone's cases, but they settled Isidore Clenert's case in just a few months. There's no records anywhere that I've been able to find, and I've turned over every rock that I could to find out what exactly happened. No one seems to know other than it was settled. Did it settle for $250,000? Did it settle for $200? No one knows. Something that's very fascinating about this asbestos industry to me is how many mysteries are still out there to be solved, and two of them involve this case. Did Brown and Hobart push Lanza to include the paragraph about tuberculosis because this specific case was pending? We don't know. Did Dr. Lanza act as an expert witness somehow with this case? Because he sure did a lot of expert testimony in other cases. No one knows. But what we do know is they were concerned enough that people would draw a conclusion between asbestos exposure and the development of tuberculosis that they pushed Lanza to put a paragraph in the study he was going to delete. That's not the only change. They also say here, Brown is writing to him, that you had omitted a sentence that said, clinically, from this study, it appeared to be of a type milder than silicosis. And this is uh, basically what that means is asbestosis appears to be milder than silicosis. This was going to be omitted, but, but uh, Dr. Lanza decided to put it back in, and Vandiver Brown took issue with it. Vandiver Brown isn't the only one who took issue with it. George Hobart did, too. And he says here, I agree with your suggestion in your letter to Dr. Lanza that there should be added to this conclusion a statement similar to that which appeared in his 1931 report, namely, clinically, it's of a type milder than silicosis. It would be very helpful to have an official report to show that there is a substantial difference between asbestosis and silicosis, and by the same token, it would be troublesome if an official report should appear from which the conclusion might be drawn that there is little, if any, difference between the two diseases. Remember, at this time, the silica industry is just getting wrecked with lawsuits. There's $30 million in just the state of New York alone pending, and companies are paying out. And, oh, they are terrified this is going to happen if silica lawyers start thinking we can do the same thing with uh, asbestos. So they definitely want to do everything they can to tell people, hey, asbestosis, it's not dangerous like silicosis. Don't stress. Don't sue us. Leave us alone. That's why Hobart wants this in here. 
And Hobart confirms, as we started out uh, with the slide earlier, one of our principal defenses and actions against the company on the common law theory of negligence has been that scientific and medical knowledge has been insufficient until a very recent period to place any owner uh, duties or burdens on the owners of these companies. I therefore dislike to have this report suggest that asbestosis might be assumed to be similar to silicosis. And there's some really good reasons he doesn't want these conclusions being drawn. By this time in 1934, there's a great public awareness of the hazards of, of silica and silicosis. And there's especially some awareness among the workers of silica and silicosis. One of the asbestos industry's primary concerns was we need to still have our cheap labor come work in our plants and our mines with this stuff. And they're very terrified if workers start thinking that this stuff is dangerous, no one's going to work at the plants. In fact, uh, in the late 1940s, there were miners that were on strike at Johns Manville's mine in Quebec because they were starting to worry about the safety hazards. So they had to have, have their, their departments come and try to reassure them, hey, this stuff's safe, don't worry. Of course, that was a lie. It was. But Johns Manville's first area of concern was, we need workers. And then their second area of concern is, well, we don't want the public to think that this stuff's dangerous because then they won't buy it. And then finally, they're still concerned about the litigation that would happen on behalf of the workers who were injured from these products. No good, from Johns Manville's opinion, no good whatsoever can come from anyone associating asbestosis and silicosis. They really want them to stay as two different, distinct diseases that have no commonalities or overlap, lest people start asking questions about safety that will start to lead to impact Johns Manville's bottom line in one way or another. So once again, this is about protecting profits. So what did Dr. Lanza do? Well, you can probably guess he altered his report. And let's see it. As we saw earlier, this report was published in December of 1934 and then reprinted by the Public Health Service in January of 1935. And I can absolutely tell you that every single asbestos defense lawyer likes to talk about this official U.S. government report as if it lends more credibility because the government put their name on it. And that's one of the strategies we'll talk about how the, the asbestos companies did is anytime they had a study that they underwrote and they were happy with the results, they tried to get the government to republish it to make it look even more authoritative. So this is the first page of Lanza's report, and let's see what changes he made. You can see in the red box area, what do you know? During the progress of the study, physicians who were practicing the communities where asbestos workers lived were questioned and stated that they did not find an unusual amount of tuberculosis among these workers. The contrast between this state of affairs and that found in a community with silicosis is noteworthy. Now remember, Lanza wanted to take this out and, and uh, Vandiver Brown and George Hobart asked him to put it in. And I want to draw your attention to something just a little bit further up this slide here. You see here it says, Several of those classed as negative stated they were short-winded and were so recorded, but too much emphasis should not be placed on statements of subjective symptoms. So Dr. Lanza, as a medical doctor and a well-trained one, he recognizes subjective stuff like if people say, you know, hey, I'm short of breath, you can't draw a lot of conclusions from that. But what conclusions can you draw about doctors being interviewed and saying, oh, yeah, I guess I didn't see as much tuberculosis here? How many doctors? How many cases did they see? Compare that with silica. None of that's there because this is worthless. This whole thing that there's a contrast between the state of affairs and asbestos workers and silica workers about tuberculosis without hard data, which is not provided, this is all a bunch of junk. But this piece of junk was put back in here at the request of two lawyers who were trying to protect Johns Manville. So keep that in mind. Dr. Lanza tried to at least take this out, but they put it back in because that's what JM wanted. And then you'll see on the next slide, just as you would have guessed, prolonged exposure to asbestos dust caused a pulmonary fibrosis of a type different from silicosis and demonstrable on x-ray films. Clinically, from this study, it appears to be a type milder than silicosis. And I highlighted from this study, because Lanza still took his medical oath and still kind of trying to do the right thing here, this is a hedge from this study. He's not saying that silicosis or that asbestosis is milder than silicosis. He's saying just from this little one study, that's the conclusion you could draw only from this. But he knows it's not. He's just putting in here from this study. So if you can read between the lines, you can figure out, 
oh, this is a hedge. And that hedge was put in at the behest of industry. And that's how these things work. Johns Manville couldn't have paid Dr. Lanza any sum of money to write a study that said, I want you to say that asbestos is safe. He's not going to do that. But what he can do, and what the role of these experts is, is to introduce doubt. Now, it said, clinically, from this study, it appears to be of a type milder than silicosis. Let's look at how that doubt introduction would work. Here's what would happen in court. They would be accused, hey, you didn't put in the same protections at your asbestos plant as the silica industry did. And what the company will introduce then instead is they'll say, yeah, but that's because Dr. Lanza here says it's milder than silicosis. So we just didn't know. This is the whole game. We didn't know. Because you can know something without knowing it. You can look at a stove and see that it's red and know that it's hot. But you could certainly testify you don't know that it's 500 degrees. You don't. The right thing to do would be to inquire, how hot is that stove? How much milder is asbestosis than silicosis? And you'd want to do that by asking for more research. You'd say, hey, we need more research on this topic. From this study, this is what I've found, but this is what I do to ask more questions. You don't see Dr. Lanza doing that. And later in this report, or this, this video, you'll see another report where a request from a legitimate researcher we need more research on this topic. We need more information. The asbestos company scrubbed that out to discourage people from doing that research. The doubt is what the experts do, because when lawyers go into court to sue the company, we have the burden. We who represent the injured have to prove that they did something wrong. They don't have to prove anything. They get to just try to poke little holes and say, well, gee, we didn't know it said it was milder than silicosis. So how are we to ever know it actually wasn't? That's what they do. That's how the cover up went on for so long, because it wasn't so blatant like, hey, we hired this doctor to say asbestos is great for you. No, they just put little bits of doubt that lawyers strategically, like like George Hobart did, strategically advise them. We want to make sure there's some doubt about this. We want to make sure there's some unanswered questions about that. So they steer research and they put lines in reports to ensure that what is knowable isn't something they don't want to take risks on. So you've seen now some of the experts that worked with the asbestos industry. Let's talk now about how the asbestos industry began working together on this problem, because this was all about Johns Manville before. And the collaboration amongst industry started to really begin in earnest in January of 1935. In January of 1935, there was a symposium on dust problems that took place in Pittsburgh. Now, the dust problems in general were the silica issue. These letters that were sent out inviting people to come to this symposium were targeted primarily to people in the silica industry because there was enough knowledge of the hazards and of the legal hazards to the companies that there was a market for some services. Let's talk a little bit about who's here at this, uh, at this particular uh, symposium. First thing we have, the guy that opens, the first speaker of this symposium is A.C. Hearth. He's a defense attorney that defended companies in silica lawsuits. That should tell you what kind of tone that this meeting has as we open it, a silica defense lawyer telling uh, the companies there how not to get sued. Look, what do you know? We've got Dr. Lanza again, and over here, we've got Donald Cummings again. These guys all knew each other and worked together. So where did this symposium take place? Well, it took place in the University Club, which was very close to the Mellon Institute. And the Mellon Institute had played a very big role in this, as you'll see here in the next few slides. Now, as I mentioned, the very first speaker was Alfred Hearth, who was a silicosis defense lawyer. I have a copy of the speech that he gave, and let's see some of the things that he had to say. This meeting has been called to provide affected industries with an opportunity of discussing a common problem, which was they didn't want to get sued anymore, and of considering ways and means of solving it. I have been advised that it is a family meeting in which we may call a spade by its rightful name with the assurance that we will not be quoted in the press or elsewhere. Well, anytime somebody says they're happy to know that they're not going to be quoted, you know they're saying things they don't want the public to hear, right? Very obvious. And this is how the symposium opens. First speaker comes out and opens his speech. This is the very first paragraph. Hey, guys, we're among friends. Let's talk straight about what's really going on with these lawsuits and how we can solve this problem. So then he says, disability resulting from the inhalation of any of these various dusts may result in liability on the part of the employer, the extent of which is now being demonstrated by the epidemic of silicosis cases. 
I'm not over-exaggerating how much these guys were terrified of these silica lawsuits. It was a big deal. The serious situation in which industry finds itself is a result of our lack of knowledge of the extent and even of the existence of the hazard and the means which should have been employed to remove it. Again, they didn't know with some of these dusts. These were some, I have some sympathy for them for this part alone. They didn't understand what they were getting into and what some of the, the problems were. This is the 1930s. Things we take for granted today haven't been invented yet. So they're still learning. And here's where I do take issue. Mr. Hearth says, I cannot feel that industry should be called upon to pay the bill. Well, why not? Industry is the one who caused this problem. People didn't just get silicosis or asbestosis of natural causes. Industry created this mess, and now they don't want to pay to clean it up. I'm old enough, I remember going to stores and seeing a sign in the window that said, you break it, you bought it. Kind of seemed fair at the time. If I'm careless with this you know, figurine or whatever and drop it and break it, I owe the, the, the store for it. Industry made all of the profits, all of the millions of dollars that Johns Manville and that other companies in the asbestos industry made, that's who should be paying the cost is out of those dollars. There's no one else's dollars to pay. Should a worker have to pay for the medical costs? Probably not. Most people aren't going to be very amenable to the idea that, hey, if you go to work and your employer injures you, you're on your own. No one likes that. The industry tried for a long time to say that Uncle Sam, meaning us, the taxpayers, that we should pick up the tab. They tried for a long time to get the government to put money aside to uh, pay people who got sick from asbestosis and other asbestos injuries. That one didn't go over very well either. Most people don't want to think, gee, you made all these millions of dollars and now it's my tax dollars that I have to pay to clean up the mess that you made. This is the mentality that industry had at the time, and many of them still to this day have, is that they're doing a societal good. That's what these guys believed. We're making the world better with our products. And oh my God, if you force us to pay the cost of making the world better, that's so unfair. But as Mr. Hearth says in the very next sentence, my feelings, however, are unimportant in view of the very definite notions to the contrary entertained by most juries. Most jurors, if asked, who should pay, the employer who created the problem or the innocent victim, will say the employer. That's what they don't like, and that's what they hope to change. Let's see what else Mr. Hearth has to say. He says that whether the employer should be held liable for injuries to his employee's health resulting from failure to provide a reasonably safe place to work depends on whether the employer had knowledge of the existence of such danger or whether in the exercise of reasonable care he should have had such knowledge. This is such an important concept, should have had such knowledge. You remember just a, a couple of slides ago that um, Lanz's report said that this appears to asbestosis appears to be much milder than silicosis. Because of that, Johns Manville can say they shouldn't have known that they had to do any further studies or they shouldn't have known they had to do other safety precautions because it didn't look like this was a big risk. When juries get to get asked what a company should have known, companies hate that because it gives an opportunity to show reality, really, that, gee, if, if you knew that asbestos was harmful to these group of people that are breathing it, you just know that it's harmful overall. A lot of what asbestos and other companies do is try to split hairs over what was knowable, and they'll try to draw distinctions that are completely meaningless. And that's something you'll see later on the asbestos companies did. They tried to play a game. Well, just because our miners got sick, we wouldn't have known that the people who made the products from the mine would get sick. And then they'll play a step further. Okay, now we know our factory workers are getting sick from breathing the dust from the products they're making. But we had no way of knowing that people who work with the products would also get sick with it. The guy that mined it got sick from it, and the guy that made the product got sick from it. But how would we know that the consumers could get sick from it? That's what they do is they play the game. This wasn't knowable. And it all comes down to exercise of reasonable care, what you either knew or should have known. And it's that doubt element again. They're trying to int introduce doubt on what they should have known. This concept, the concept of uh, whether in the exercise of reasonable care, he should have had that knowledge. This is a foundational concept of our whole injury law. And let me give you an example to kind of to show you how this works. If you drive a car, you have a duty to make sure that your car is safe. So that means if you know that for example, your brakes don't work and your tires are bald and you get in an accident because your brakes don't work and your tires are bald, you'll be at fault for that. You should have known this was dangerous. You don't get to say, 
I'm, I'm not a mechanic. I don't know how to check my brakes. I'm not a, a tire expert. I don't know if they're bald. You are presumed that you should know these things. You should know that if you can put a penny in the tread of your tire and it doesn't cover Abe Lincoln's head, your tires are bald. You should know if when you're driving, your brakes are squealing, that's an indicator that they're on the way out. So this is the key is how do you avoid knowing for industry It's key. What are the squealing noises that tell you there's a danger? Like when your brakes are about shot, they squeal really bad. What are those squealing noises in for the asbestos industry? Because that will tell them the brakes are bad. They don't want that kind of knowledge because then they have to make changes. If your car is making really weird noises, some of you might decide, you know what? I'm going to just turn the radio up because I can't afford to deal with this issue. That's what the asbestos companies were trying to do is just turn the radio up and ignore it until they had the resources to fix the issue. But if that noise you're ignoring happens to be a safety defect in the car and you get in an accident because of that defect, you'll be held liable if anyone finds out you just turned the radio up because you didn't want to dig. They're trying to avoid any flags from getting raised that would say a reasonable person here would dig. So let's see what else Hearth had to say. He said that, you should be concerned not only with the successful defense of your own cases, but of others as well. In this situation, the answer to the age-old query, am I my brother's keeper, is emphatically yes. Each verdict against the defendant encourages others to bring suit and provides ambulance-chasing lawyers with arguments and money to see that they do. Again, the first speaker at this meeting about the dust problem is talking about ambulance-chasing lawyers and we got to make sure we all stick together because if they sue one of us, they're going to sue the rest of us. They all had that mentality that we have to help each other because once that knowledge gets out, if a big verdict comes out against John's Manville and says their products are dangerous, that verdict triggers a duty for every other manufacturer of asbestos to know, hey, these guys just got held liable for selling the same thing that we have. We should see if these products are dangerous too. And if they don't, they get to be held liable. That's the way that the law works, and this is why he's telling everybody, you all need to stick together because if one of us goes down, we all go down. You see that in, in any, you know, any mob movie that's, that's worth its salt will have the, the scene where they're worried about so and so is going to flip on the rest of them. We're all in this together. That's how they felt. We're all in this together because if one of us goes down with all these lawsuits, the rest of us will too. Now, Vandiver Brown attended this symposium, and he wrote up a memo to several other companies. Let's look at his memo. He writes, on or about December 12th of 1934, the Mellon Institute of Industrial Research sent a letter to 85 industries. Now, JM itself did not get this invite, but the Asbestos Institute did. Vandiver Brown heard about the meeting and surreptitiously attended this meeting. He was not there officially because he was afraid that Johns Manville would be tagged as having the same dust problems that the rest of the industries, especially the silica industry, was having. So there's already a little cloak and dagger stuff going on where he shows up after sneakily getting invited in, not officially. And then what happens? He opens his memo with an impressive list of experts specializing upon the various aspects of the dust problem attended, and he called out a couple people by name our old friends, Dr. Lanza and Donald Cummings. He's already laying the groundwork to start working with these people. He said that only two forms of dust, namely free silica and asbestos, are definitely known to produce disabling fibrosis of the lung. Well, there it is right there. I mean, their company attorney admitting and writing, yeah, our product causes disabling fibrosis. This should be everything you need right here to prove Johns Manville knew what was going on and didn't want to take action. And he says, the fact that no other dust is known to produce disability has not prevented entirely groundless claims aggregating millions and even hundreds of millions of dollars being brought against industries which don't have a silica or asbestos dust hazard. For example, Dr. Lanza pointed out no one had ever maintained gypsum dust was harmful, and yet nevertheless, the gypsum industry has suits pending against it, covering claims in excess of $4 million. Dr. Lanza is at this symposium to give a medical speech but he's talking about how the gypsum industry is getting sued for millions of dollars. Doesn't sound like he's there to issue a medical opinion. It sounds like he's there to try to drum up business, which he was. It appeared that the, among the problems common to all industries were the following. 
the menace of ambulance chasing lawyers in combination with unscrupulous doctors. These are Alfred Hearth's words coming out of Vandiver Brown's typewriter. He's quoting him extensively. As I've read the whole speech that, that Hearth gave was 22 pages. And a lot of this stuff that Vandiver's writing about is exactly what Hearth was talking about. The uncertainty surrounding the diagnosis of any of the various forms of pneumoconiosis are so many that a question of fact is presented in every case. Now, that's just standard. In any case where there's a lawsuit alleging an injury, you have to be able to prove the diagnosis. Why they're so surprised at this, I'm not sure of. Expert testimony can be produced by both plaintiff and defendant, and it's for the jury to decide whose experts are correct in their interpretations. This is a, a common problem that big companies have, is they want to have their expert witnesses go and testify, but they're afraid, because they're paying the expert witnesses, that juries won't believe them. And in many cases, the juries are right not to believe the experts that are offered by the defendants. Look at what Dr. Lanza did. He had things he wanted to put in his report that would be harmful to JM's interests. So from, upon pressure from them, he took that stuff out. How credible would Dr. Lanza have seemed to a jury if they find out, not only do I take money from these people, but I also alter my medical reports and my other opinions based upon that payment? And it probably won't come as a shock well, Dr. Lanza is not the only expert who alters his opinions based upon who's signing his paycheck. It's a problem pervasive throughout the industry that when people are paid to do something, they typically will do that. And if they are paid to change their testimony or, or nuance it in some way to benefit the company that's paying for them to do it, they often do. This issue that the juries are going to distrust an expert that's paid by the defendant is a problem that they're looking to solve by having intermediaries pay these doctors instead of the money coming directly from them. They're trying to build a front group that that's who the doctors work for and that's who funded these studies. You'll see a little later on in here, they make it incredibly explicit. They write out, we're going to have these, we're going to pay for these studies in secret. And if we decide when they're published that, that makes a good idea to say that we paid for them, great, we will. But if not, we'll keep it quiet. So part of what Vandiver Brown is doing in this memo is starting to, to pitch to other companies, hey, we should start funding this because it's going to protect us. The next problem that Vandiver talked about is, is this is number two, the desirability of making various dust diseases compensable under properly drawn workman's compensation laws. One of the speakers stated that the strongest bulwark against future disaster for industry is the enactment of properly drawn occupational diseases. Guess who that speaker was? Yes, it was Hearth. And he talked extensively about that the industry needs to petition for new workers' compensation laws that will take all of these questions out of the hands of the jury. And you'll see more of that on the next slide. It said such legislation would eliminate the jury and empower a medical board to pass upon the existence of the disease and the extent of the disability. What they're wanting to do here is eliminate the ability for anybody to get a diagnosis of an asbestos-related or a dust-related disease that didn't go through a medical board that they created and set up. I wonder how many times that the industry-funded medical board would find a disability, right? That's their goal. Goal number two here, eliminate the shyster lawyer and the quack doctor since fees would be strictly limited by law. You understand why they hate asbestos attorneys. They sue them and they get money. But they also talk in a lot of their memos uh, very derisive terms about country doctors and people who didn't go to the medical schools that Dr. Lanza and others went to. And they're very dismissive of the idea that anybody could have an opinion that differs from theirs that could be correct. Now, Dr. Lanza was a true believer. I've read enough of his papers. He really didn't think there was anything to this asbestosis stuff. He thought it was all fake and that it was going to go away, that there really wasn't a hazard. So how could some country doctor who's not as educated and working at, at MetLife corporate headquarters know more than him? Well, guess what, Dr. Lanza? You got it wrong. Asbestosis was not the, quote, mare's nest that you referred to it as. This stuff was really deadly, and they got it wrong. But what they want is to ensure that it's only their guys that are making those calls. That's what they're trying to do with this medical board and getting rid of the quack doctor. And the next thing, permit the correcting of initial mistakes in the making of awards by providing for hearings to reduce or eliminate awards if proof could be adduced that the claimant was not disabled or his disability had been overestimated. And Mr. Hearth in his speech has an anecdote talking about these things... 
I've heard these stories for, for so many years. It's, it's the same, same story. Hey, there's this guy who filed a claim and he pretended to be really sick and we sent an investigator over and he was doing this great feat of strength. The one that, that Mr. Hearth is talking about is supposedly somebody faked their disability from silicosis and then they hit a double or a triple and a home run at this baseball game. And hey, there's this anecdotal story about a guy who got money who shouldn't have. So we therefore need to be able to pull money back all the time. What they're really saying here is we want to have something put in place where we can send private investigators out to try to get proof that somebody isn't sick and then yank their awards back. They're wanting to spy on people after they get an award to make sure, because under workers' comp, you don't get one award, you'd get awards over periods of time. So they want to be able to stop getting those awards. Yes, of course, some people fake injuries and that shouldn't happen. But this symposium with medical doctors is telling them, here's how you avoid paying people who get sick. That tells you something about the character of this symposium. So the idea of properly drawn occupational disease legislation, what does properly drawn mean? Well, I know what it meant to Vandiver Brown, what it meant to Alfred Hearth, and what it meant was that legislation that ensures asbestos industries and silica industries get to keep doing business the way that they see fit and they can manage the costs of the people that they hurt. The thing that has been continuous since the 1930s through today is big business always wants predictability on their potential costs of hurting or killing people. They argue extensively, we need to put a cap on the amount of damages that people can recover. Yeah, they don't want to pay one large big check. Sure, I get that. That's why they say we should only have a $250,000 maximum. But it's not just about saving that $250,000 or, or not having to pay more than that. What it's about is knowing if we kill 10 people, the maximum we're going to have to pay is $2.5 million. Well, how much money does our product make? Well, we'll make 10 million. Okay, I'll gamble on killing those 10 people. But if there's an unpredictability to the award, like with the big verdicts you sometimes hear about, all of their calculations go out the window and they cannot just make it a clinical cold decision. Will we make money doing this even if we kill people? Yes or no. Now there's an element of risk and properly drawn occupational disease legislation to these gentlemen means legislation that eliminates the possibility for an unforeseen risk to their bottom line. If they know how often people are getting sick and they know how much it costs to pay those sick people, they can easily just do the math. We're going to pay out this much in claims this year, but we're still going to be left with profit. That's what they're trying to do is make this a predictable element of a cost of doing business. How much does it cost us to hurt our workers, our customers, our clients? That's what that means. Vandiver's memo concludes with uh, Mr. Roger Hitchens, the president of American Refractories Institute, was made the chairman of a committee which held a meeting Tuesday evening after the close of the symposium. Now, you saw the picture of the university club earlier, what the symposium was, and it's very easy to imagine a group of people getting together, probably in some sort of a bar afterwards, having whatever the drinks of the 30s were and talking about how are we going to solve this problem? And they have an informal election where Mr. Roger Hitchens is elected the chairman of this new committee. Mr. Hitchens was designated to meet with Mr. Weidlin of the Mellon Institute, that's the guy that ran this department at the Mellon Institute, and ask him to make a proposal in definite and concrete form as to the manner in which the Mellon Institute might be able to assist the various industries for a fee of $25,000. Again, that's $25,000 in 1935. This is a very substantial amount of money. So these gentlemen have all gotten together in their club chairs at the university club, and they've said, you know what? Let's see what Mellon can do if we give him $25,000. And the next step is for Mellon to make the pitch. This is what we could do with that money. So Mellon made the pitch, and after we're getting the pitch, Roger Hitchens is going to try to recruit other members, other companies, to raise the sum of $25,000. That's about half a million dollars today. So Hitchens is looking to get around a half a million dollars worth of commitment from other members to get the Mellon Institute to do some of the, the dirty work that they want done to help solve this dust problem. The dust problem, meaning the litigation problem. Now, the Mellon Institute, I've got a great, great advertisement here. When they built the Mellon Institute in this building, uh, Jones and Laughlin Steel was so proud of getting to do this great building that they advertised it. 
Mellons uh, were in, were a group of bankers, uh, a family of bankers that funded much of the Industrial Revolution, steel, oil, gas, all of that stuff. These were big names. And getting the Mellon Institute in this really official looking, I mean, this looks like a government building, to get their name on the work, the research that they want done, that would be a big win for the asbestos and the silica and the, just the dust industry in general because they're buying this credibility. And unfortunately for the world, the Mellon Institute was selling their credibility, as you'll see here shortly. So Roger Hitchens begins recruiting members to fund and join this organization, and he sends out a letter to all of the people that showed up at this symposium. It says, uh, all individuals who attended the symposium were got a letter from Dr. Weidlin, and they're receiving copies of this letter. The purpose of this letter is to ask your company or your trade association, as the case may be, if it will subscribe for an amount not to exceed $500 for the establishment of a coordinating agency as the first move toward a study of the many existing phases of the industrial dust problem. Coordinating agency, they want to have one shop where everything goes so they can have total control over the sphere of knowledge what is known and what is deemed to be knowable about these problems. They want to do it all in one spot for efficiency and for control. So he continues that Dr. Wiseland's letter was written at the request of a few of the industries in which the dust hazard exists in an effort to determine whether sufficient interest existed to warrant having a meeting for the general discussion of the question. And with the basic idea, if such a meeting could be held, it might be possible to establish a coordinating agency for the collection of all available data on silicosis and other dust diseases and its dissemination to the interested industries. Now remember, this is about what they knew and what they should have known. If the Mellon Institute in its own studies finds something harmful and does not disseminate it to the rest of the companies that fund it, then those companies don't know what that hazard was. They can't be deemed, well, you should have known because the Mellon Institute knew. What they're doing instead is the Mellon Institute will control the flow of information and the companies get to all pat themselves on the back and say, we care about these problems so much, we're funding the Mellon Institute and the Mellon Institute is trying to control all knowledge. They're trying to gain everything so they can tell us what we need to know. And part of what the it became the Industrial Hygiene Foundation, that's what this project is, part of what the Industrial Hygiene Foundation did was shape knowledge, write it up, and send it out to their membership. If this were going on in 2022, we might say that Hitchens is just trying to crowdfund a, a PR campaign, really. This, this, this is the goal is to get people to pay for this third-party institute to manage any studies that are coming out about dust diseases, public relations issues, the whole thing, even guidance on how to set their factories and plants and stuff up to avoid liability. So this is what the, the, the germination of the seed that will become the Industrial Hygiene Foundation. See, next it says, uh, Dr. Weidlin explained the interest of the Institute was simply the desire to assist industry towards a realization of the problem and development of a possible program of activity. In other words, he stood there with his hand out saying, if you give us money, we'll solve your problem. Mellon Institute wasn't doing this for free. 25 grand was half a million bucks today. It's a lot of money. And they people are going to want something in return for it. And again, we talked about uh, Mr. Hearth was happy that it was a family meeting so he could say what he wanted. Confirmed, no reporters were present at this meeting and no stenographic notes were kept. Attendance was by registration only and there were present nearly 200 representatives of the many important industries. Wow, gotta, gotta stress that there's no reporters there and there's no stenographic note taking. What are you guys talking about with respect to health concerns of your industry that you don't want getting out there? They're talking about we're getting sued because our products are causing harm. How do we save ourselves? That's what the point of this was. And then finally, Hitchens concludes in this letter, the temporary organization committee feels the importance of this subject to industry can scarcely be overestimated. The dust problem in every industry raises certain problems common to all, such as those concerned with engineering, like respirators and dust elimination and prevention, and the medical, legal, and legislative aspects. Now, I'm not going to say that everything that they did was terrible or wrong. A lot of the stuff they did with the engineering controls about respirators and dust control, that was good. That was a societal good to start getting these things out there. And they weren't fudging numbers to say, oh, hey, this respirator, you can trust it when you couldn't. They were trying to advance the state of the art of the knowledge to get the health of their industry on a proper footing. It wasn't about protecting workers. It was about protecting industry 
by doing whatever the minimal protection for workers was required to do. The real inconscionable, the unconscionable stuff that went on was all done in the in, in the legal and legislative realm, not in the engineering realm. I just want to get that part clear. So Roger Hitchens, when he's sending this letter out, he includes the letter that, uh, that, that Dr. Weidland from the Institute sent to him. And this next slide talks from the letter that Weidland sent, the pitch letter, in other words. When, when they'd said that they met uh, at the club after the symposium and they wanted a more definite proposal on what Mellon Institute could do for that 25 grand, this is that. This is that definite proposal. If this work were to be centralized in the Mellon Institute, it could be carried out as a part of our air hygiene research. And in fact, they created the Air Hygiene Foundation. That's what that became. The director appointed to handle investigation would also be the head of the institution or the organizations that the industry would set up. In this way, the work could be carried out in a most confidential manner as to who was supporting the research, and no one would know what industries or individuals were contributing to the fund. Doesn't that just sound sleazy? Hey, guys, pay us. We'll do your research, and no one ever has to know you're behind this. But it would enable the organization to get soundly established so that later on, if later on it was desired to come out in the open, it could be arranged. Now, what does it mean by soundly established? It means that this is going to look like it comes from the Mellon Institute, which is very widely respected, not from you, asbestos industries as a front group. This is a reputable institute of learned men who care about these problems. Recall earlier, we, we mentioned that, that Hearth was complaining that, hey, juries are not going to believe our experts because they know that we're paying them. That's what they're buying, the ability to have studies and experts from a supposedly objective third-party respected industry from the Mellon Institute. Juries will believe the Mellon Institute. They're not going to believe your company doctor. But if you can make them be the same thing, then you win in court. And that's what the intent of this, this was. The secret funding was to be able to buy the credibility that would not be established if the paychecks were coming directly from the asbestos companies. This is how they're using, uh, we today would probably call it dark money. That's what they're trying to do is have dark money fund a group that is going to put out papers and science that is really crucial for all of their litigation. In other words, Dr. Weidland is saying, is, hey, you can give us half a million of $2022 and we'll do what you want and no one's ever going to know that you paid for it. We'll keep this secret. Weidland's letter continues, of primary importance in the initial stage is the collection of available data published and as far as possible unpublished. They want to get it all. They want to know everything out there that there is to do with these dust diseases. These data must then be evaluated and correlated, and in this phase of the work, it is assumed that it will be possible to secure the advice and cooperation of the recognized specialists in the fields of medicine, law, chemistry, physics, and engineering. Evaluation should include the weeding out of data that cannot be considered as authoritative. Now, this is really a deep concept to get what they're saying here, if you read between the lines. They're trying to set it up only reputable experts work with the Mellon Institute, and if you're not working with the Mellon Institute, you're a quack, you're a shyster, you're an idiot, your work is unreliable, it's not trustworthy. Everybody trustworthy is with the Mellon Institute. If they're not with them, there's a reason, and you shouldn't believe them. They're trying to dictate who is authoritative and who is not. And I can assure you their criteria for who is a good authoritative researcher is based on what's in the interest of the people funding it, not in the interest of public health. And he continues again in the next slide. In preparing to work out such a program, it would be necessary to compile a list of specialists in all fields who are engaged in a study of dust problems to have determined among them who may not be properly qualified. Again, do you think these qualifications mean what was their GPA? No, it means how willing are you to carry water for industry? and whose results might therefore not be entirely acceptable, to attempt as far as feasible to have investigational work correlated and synchronized. Again, we talk about knowledge. What did they know and when did they know it? If you have a central group that is running studies, they can control what becomes known. So I used an example earlier about not knowing if your stove, what temperature your stove is, but knowing that it's hot. These are the guys that are going to make sure that the study to see how hot that stove is never gets conducted. So none of their members can ever be tagged with the knowledge of you knew your product was harmful in this way. Mellon is going to make sure that those studies are not done while they're quietly advising people behind the scenes. Hey, man, you've got a problem. Here's how you can fix it. Fix it before anyone finds out. 
So that's they're running interference to try to make sure industry can clean its messes up before they get sued or otherwise held accountable. And they conclude that with to be in a position to make reasonable grants to qualified individuals or agencies to study special problems or phases of problems. You don't have to guess what kind of studies they're going to green light and what they're going to turn down. If it's something industry doesn't want, they're not going to fund that study. They are going to fund studies that are going to make industry look in a great light. That's their role. Wideland writes that uh, some aspects that occur to mind are the pathological and psychological effects of dust of various kinds, alone and in combination. For this, the classification of dust is necessary. And important from both medical and legal standpoints is the preparation of court cases. Okay, so they're just putting it right out in the open. We're going to have doctors that are going to work with you on your court cases to make sure you don't lose and that we're able to paint anything that the other side, that all of their doctors are going to be quacks and all of their lawyers are going to be shysters. But you, associating with the Mellon Institute, get all of the goodwill that our name provides and you can trust that we're going to keep you from losing your court cases. That's what that part of the pitch means. The next part is dissemination through proper channels of authoritative information. This is where they're going to use their big name, Mellon, to say, if we're publishing it, this is good. And if it's coming out of some small journal, well, you can ignore that. It's a fringe journal. Only only people on the, on the periphery read this. It's not important. This next part here, I love this part, maintaining contact as closely as possible with independent agencies and cooperating agencies. What do you think that means? Independent, people that aren't doing what we tell them to, and cooperating, people who are doing what we want. And in this case, agencies, most likely is meaning government agencies, because a big part of this whole project was the recruitment of federal government resources. You saw that Lanza made sure that his report got published in the U.S. Public Health Service bulletins. So a cooperating agency is one where you can pick up the phone and say, hey, I just published this study. Can you reprint it in your government publication for us? That's the kind of thing that you get when you get admission to this big club. Study and synopsis of existing pertinent legislation, including compensation and assistance in the preparation of safety codes and fair laws. They're really hammering home. We want to help you track what your litigation costs are going to be. We're going to show you from around the country what they are, and we're going to work to make sure that laws are passed that are fair. You can figure out what that one means. The correlating agency suggested program of initial activities in the medical realm. Study the assembled data and report what phases have duplication of effort. So if two people are running the same study, they can get one to get canceled. And to what phases should have further research. And here, with the objective of enlisting the cooperation of the American Medical Association in setting up authoritative and approved standards of diagnosis and correction. Now, to diagnose asbestosis, you have to look at an x-ray. And I've looked at thousands of x-rays, and I could probably diagnose one out of 3,000 people. It's very difficult to see. I don't have the skills. It's a, it's a very subjective uh, thing to look at an x-ray for special markers of injury on there. So... I can't spot it with my eyes because I'm not trained, but we work with doctors who have special training to do that. And the doctors who have the training, they will grade your asbestosis from anywhere from very, very mild all the way up to really severe. What they wanted the AMA to do is to say that anything that's not really severe actually is an asbestosis, so it shouldn't be compensable. You shouldn't even get to sue over it. This is a big theme that the asbestos industry had, both in the medical and the legal side. They want a standard, then that says it all. In this case, they're trying to get the AMA to say, if you don't follow our recommendations on the diagnosis of an asbestos or a dust-related disease, then your diagnosis isn't good. It's a suspect diagnosis, and court should throw it out and should pay no attention to it. Here, just like the Mellon Institute is selling its good name, they're trying to buy the good name of the American Medical Association by getting the AMA to put a stamp on, this is how it's done. If it's not done this way, you can't trust that doctor. That's a scary thought. Thankfully, the AMA didn't do this. The next thing they talk about, and this is a big one, they say that they want the an objective of setting up authoritative and approved standards for the control of industrial dusts, which, if complied with by industries or industrial companies, will act as a defense against personal injury suits. What I call this is the get-out-of-jail-free card. This is for them the holy grail. They want a standard put in place that if they complied with, they're off the hook. 
Doesn't matter if the standard is completely and utterly meaningless. Doesn't matter if the standard still allows people to get sick and die. What they want to do is be able to come into court and say, hey, the Mellon Institute said you need to meet this standard and then no one will get sick. And I met that standard. I'm done. The way they did it was what they called, we'll talk in other videos, the threshold limit values. How much asbestos is safe to breathe? They didn't really care if it was safe or wasn't safe to breathe. They just wanted a number put on it. And in every asbestos trial that has ever happened, the companies will always say, we met the threshold limit value, so therefore we aren't the bad guys. Even if they know that that threshold limit value is wrong, they just want to be able to say, I followed the rules, so therefore you can't sue me. Had nothing to do with protecting anything other than the bottom line. That's why I call it a get out of jail free card, because what their goal was is to have, as long as we do these things, no matter what the consequences are, we're safe. That's what they wanted. And we continue. This agency, the Mellon Institute, was going to collect their present experience as to all personal injury suits and claims going out of industrial hazards and claimed diseases. So they're going to ask all the members, first from the members, hey, tell us every single time you've been sued, what you were sued for, how much you paid, and then start getting that information from other uh, companies across the country so they can get a picture on what the costs are and how likely they are to be sued. And they can coordinate defenses to ensure, because as Mr. Hearth said, hey, you're your brother's keeper, because if you get sued and people beat you, they're going to start suing all of your other industries. So they're trying to keep a tight control over all of that information so they can see where the trouble spots are from their perspective. And again, on the legal side, just like they wanted with the AMA, here they say that they want to enlist the cooperation of the American Bar Association and local bar association in stopping the racket of suing them. They don't think they should be getting sued at all, and they want the American Bar Association to put rules in place that would somehow prevent them from getting sued. This particular project didn't go very far. The Bar Association never put any rules out like that. But that was their goal. They wanted the American Medical Association to limit the number of potential people that could even be diagnosed. And then of those few people that were diagnosed, they wanted to put so many limits on lawyers that they couldn't bring those cases. Typically, what those limits were was going to be, we want to put limits on how much you can charge. We talked earlier that the attorneys typically work on a contingency fee basis, meaning they get a portion of the recovery. Their payment is contingent upon winning. And that's the only way that people, regular working people, could afford to hire these attorneys. Because otherwise, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, the last case that my firm was involved in, we spent about $400,000 to bring that one to trial. You can't ask a person off the street, hey, yeah, I'll represent you, but I'm going to need $400,000 to go to trial plus an hourly fee. If that were the law, there'd never be any asbestos lawsuits, which is exactly what industry was trying to make happen. No doctor is able to diagnose it. And even if you could, no lawyer can take the case. That's justice to those people. And Wideland continues, as bad as that was, they still want to get copies of any existing or pending legislative enactment relating in any way to dust or workers' compensation so they can start tracking that and start moving towards lobbying as we know it today. Uh, as we know it today in, in the 21st century, industries do this stuff all the time. They want to push out, hey, this is what we think the law should be. Federal government, please make this the law. That's what they're trying to do here. And then, as it says on the next slide, that their objective is to secure state laws of a uniform character, which, when complied with, will fairly and properly protect the interest of industry. So this is a twofer. A uniform character of state laws, this goes back to predictability. Remember I said earlier that corporations hate when there is some unpredictability to lawsuits that, oh, God, this verdict was much bigger than we thought it could be. We want to have a cap. The other thing they hate is 50 different states having 50 different laws to comply with. They only want one set of laws because otherwise it gets complicated. Uh, we have employees in a number of different states, and I can have some sympathy here that, you know, it's sometimes it's difficult to comply with what this state has for their payroll requirements reporting to the state or this or that or the other thing. There is a lot of burden. And I understand that from industry, it's cheaper to try to have one set of laws. But they didn't want the laws to be fair to anybody injured. They wanted it to be fair only to them. 
So that was the intent of Roger Hitchens sending out the letter to all of these members to try to make this happen, to put this group together at the Mellon Institute that initially was called the Air Hygiene Foundation and in 1941 changed over to the Industrial Hygiene Foundation. So how successful were they in creating this? Let's take a look at what Vandiver Brown had to say. He said in 1936, about a year later, he's writing to a a, a vice president uh, over at Keesby and Madison as an asbestos company. And he writes, although the Air Hygiene Foundation is approaching various problems relating to air hygiene from an unbiased viewpoint, it is nevertheless the creature of industry and the one institution that employers can rely up for a completely sympathetic appreciation of their viewpoint. Creature of industry. I mean, he admits it straight up. That's what this is. This is do what you're told for industry. It's not an independent research group for the good of mankind. It's their Frankenstein's monster. So that's in 1936. What happens a few years later? I've got a membership listing here for you from 1946 of the Industrial Hygiene Foundation. You know the stated goals of the organization. Let's look who's running it. On the board of trustees, well, Vandiver Brown's there, no surprise. Dr. Gardner from the Saranac Laboratory is there, and I want to reiterate again, he's not a bad guy. He was doing his best and was thwarted. A.C. Hearth, at the time he spoke at the original meeting, he was uh, at a different law firm, and since then he'd worked before Owens, Illinois, who made a lot of asbestos products. And of course, Dr. Lanz is there also as a trustee. So these are the guys running the show. And on the medical committee, you've got Dr. Lanza as the chairman. And on the legal committee, you've got Vandiver Brown and A.C. Hearth. These are the people that ran the Industrial Hygiene Foundation. And in many asbestos court cases, industry will stand there with a straight face and say that the Industrial Hygiene Foundation just did good work. And it's truly unbiased and was very helpful. No, it wasn't. Look who funded it and look who ran it. That tells you everything you need to know about what they did. We're going to have more videos coming up about the Industrial Hygiene Foundation because they were a really big player and there's too much to cover in here. So we're going to switch gears now and we're going to talk about the studies that the asbestos industry, the very early ones that they conducted in secret. And we're going to now finally talk in depth about Saranac, the Saranac Laboratory. First, I want to encourage anybody to visit the URL on the on the slide below. It has some wonderful pictures of the actual laboratory, which is today a museum. So when you read about the studies or hear about anything, that room on the right, that's where this stuff happened. It's preserved. I'm going to take a trip there in the near future and hopefully make a video about this place because this is kind of ground zero for some of the studies that were very foundational to asbestos law and medicine. So how did they get involved in this business? How did Saranac get involved in doing this? Well, you already saw that they were present at that symposium. And in fact, one of the last two speakers of the day, if you remember the program, was Donald Cummings. He was going to talk about how Saranac can help with this mission of ending this dust problem. And by problem, I meant the litigation. So here's the letter that that Vandiver Brown sent to Leroy Gardner after the industries worked out, yep, we're going to fund these studies. And he says, you can consider this letter as an authorization to commence the contemplated experiments with asbestos dust for the purpose of determining more definitely the causes and effects of asbestosis. It's my understanding that among other questions which it is anticipated these experiments will answer are the following. Okay, here's what they actually wanted Saranac to study. Again, they started with the hopes of they wanted to control the dust problem. They didn't really want to keep making people sick. They just didn't want to pay for those that they did. They weren't actively plotting, let's kill people. They're like, I don't want to pay for the damage I've done, but help me not do future damage. So the first question they wanted answered was, what concentration of dust is necessary to produce the fibrosis of the lungs, which is designated as asbestosis? Today, as I sit here, there is still no answer. No one can tell you. All that we know is that there is no known safe level of asbestos exposure. That doesn't mean that one breath of asbestos will make you sick, but it also doesn't mean that one breath won't. We simply don't know. There's no way to tell even today. So as much work as Dr. Gardner tried to do on this one, we still don't have an answer. That's why there really isn't any asbestos manufacturing in the United States anymore, because they don't know how you can make it safe. You just can't. So question number one, still don't know the answer to. Question number two, whether exposure to asbestos dust will produce asbestosis without the existence of a previous infection and whether the x-ray changes found in advanced human asbestosis can be reproduced in animals without infection. And by without infection, he means animals that don't currently have one, not will it give them an infection. 
Well, the answer to this one, yes, you can absolutely produce asbestosis without evidence of a previous infection. And the infection, it's probably at the top of his mind, is tuberculosis. And I can tell you, I have represented one gentleman who did get asbestosis after having tuberculosis, and his lungs were in terrible shape because t tuberculosis uh, definitely m makes that far worse. What they didn't know was, were only people that got tuberculosis likely to get asbestosis? No, not in the least. And can these x-ray changes be pre reproduced in, in healthy animals? Yes, absolutely they can. Number three, whether the fibrosis produced by asbestos is of the progressive type. That is, will the fibrosis increase once it started, even after exposure to the dust has ceased? Yes, asbestosis is a progressive disease. Once you get it, you've got it, and over time, it will get worse. Typically, it doesn't get terribly worse with the exposures that people have had it recently. Somebody who started working in an asbestos plant in 1910 was exposed to a lot more dust than somebody who started working there in 1970. So the progressive nature for somebody who started in 1970, it will still be there, but it is not likely to progress as far as death versus people who started working 100 years ago. It was. Number four, whether the fibrosis resulting from exposure to asbestos dust is occasioned by the silicon content of the asbestos or by its fibrous structure. They didn't know what caused the fibrosis. If you watched uh, part three of our video, you can learn more about this, but in a nutshell, it's not the silicon, it's the fibrous structure. These fibers are very, very, very tiny. They get into the lungs and they cause the problems. We have a lot of good content on that in video number three of Asbestos 101, so you can learn more if you want to watch that. And number five, whether the presence of asbestos bodies has any diagnostic significance. We cover uh, asbestos bodies in video number three, and basically what happens is some asbestos can get lodged into the body and will stay there and show up uh, in the bloodstream and sometimes even asbestos in phlegm. People can cough that out and put it under a microscope and you can see that. What Vandiver here wants to know is, can somebody have asbestosis if they don't have asbestos bodies? They're looking for a simple way to diagnose if it's asbestosis or not. So for example, if you have somebody spit into a cup, put that under a microscope and it doesn't show asbestos in, the, in, their, in their actual, in their spit, what Vandiver would love to be able to know is that he doesn't have asbestosis. They're looking for a clear cut yes, no. And the answer to that question is, no, it doesn't have any diagnostic significance the way he wanted it. If you have asbestos bodies, that's additional evidence that you have asbestosis, but you don't have to have an asbestos body to prove that you have asbestosis. So that's what these studies were contemplated to do. That's the questions they wanted to know. And if they had the answers to those questions, they could then figure out how to make sure the industry isn't getting sued, especially what's the safe level of dust. That was the biggest one that they really needed to know. And again, there is no safe level. And you don't have to take my word for it that there's no clear safe level of asbestos exposure because no less reputable a body than the American Cancer Society has that right on their webpage about asbestos. There is no clear safe level of exposure. Every medical association that has any worth whatsoever has all come to similar conclusions. So there was no way for industry to get that get out of jail free card by knowing as long as we keep the dust below this level, people will be safe. There is no safe level. You can't work occupationally with asbestos and not risk getting sick. Now, the Saranac lab discovered a lot of important things about asbestos, including answers to some of the questions that were posed. But why didn't that information get out? It didn't get out because of this right here in Vandiver's letter. It's our further understanding that the results obtained will be considered the property of those who are advancing the required funds, who will determine whether, to what extent, and in what manner they shall be made public. In the event it is deemed desirable that the results be made public, the manuscript of your study will be submitted to us for approval prior to publication. And this is why I've tried to really make a point that, that Dr. Gardner was not a bad guy. He kept trying to get permission to publish his findings, and they would never let him put out any of the findings that they didn't like. What this clause does is let them run whatever studies they want, if the results are good, hey, Saranac Lab did this great study, which is really reputable, you can trust them, and the industry looks good. And if the study has bad results, they just bury it and no one says anything. That's how this cover-up was perpetrated from the medical industry, was willingness to sign an agreement that said, hey, if we find something that's absolutely terrible about public health, we'll sit on it for you. 
And it was confirmed. And this next slide here is the letter from uh, Dr. Gardner back to Vandiver Brown. And he says, the Saranac Laboratory agrees the results of these studies shall become the property of the contributors and that the manuscripts of any reports shall be submitted for approval of the contributors before publication. Now, this was sent in November of 1936. The report wasn't published until 1950. World War II broke out. Donald Cummings died. Leroy Gardner died. Not in the war, other, other causes. So a lot of the main figures died. Eventually, by 1950, it comes out. What do we have here? At the bottom, this is the first page of the, the manuscript of that was published, and it says at the bottom, this series of studies of asbestosis initiated at the laboratory more than 20 years ago by the late Dr. Gardner, director of the laboratory, was nearly completed at the time of his death in October of 46. Although partial reports and informal reviews of some of the experiments had been given from time to time by Dr. Gardner, this paper presents for the first time a complete survey of the entire experimental investigation. Now, as we said, Gardner did try to get some information out, and the industry allowed him to talk about a few things here and there, but there were a lot of things that he did not get to publish. It is my belief, and I'll never know this for certain, but from all of the papers of, of, of manuscripts of his and letters and things of his that I've read, I have a very strong feeling that Dr. Gardner was slow walking this paper, hoping that somebody else would break some news that if it already became into the public domain, the asbestos companies wouldn't care if he published because it would be too late. That did not happen, and he didn't get to see his work published before his untimely death. But Dr. Gardner, who started the studies on asbestosis, discovered something else that he was forced to keep secret. And I don't want to give the game away, but it was a deadly secret, and I can't recommend this magazine article enough to you. Uh, it, the link to it's available on our website. And this picture to me is remarkable because it shows Dr. Gardner is the, the taller gentleman on the left, and Dr. Vorwald, who succeeded him, is there on the right. Now, here's a contrast between Dr. Gardner and Dr. Vorwald. Dr. Gardner constantly was begging for permission. Can I please publish this? Or he was also trying to seek third-party grants. In fact, he tried to seek one grant that Dr. Lanza secretly scuttled because he didn't want the study to be run. But Dr. Gardner was like, hey, if I could get a grant from someone else to do this study, I wouldn't be bound by the terms of my agreement for the studies I've been doing. So he was trying to get money to publish this information so the world could know. Dr. Vorwald became a consultant for the asbestos industry and took a lot of money from them before he died. So here's the two people. In this article, I can't recommend reading it enough if for no other reason than as you look at this picture of Dr. Vorwald, I want you to imagine what is written in this article. It is, when he showed up to testify, he wore all black with a black top hat. So look at this guy and think about what must that have looked like? Guy shows up to testify in a top hat? Wow, I wish I could have been around for that. What we do have around to see though is Dr. Vorwald kept files, and after his death, they were preserved. And here's an original draft of the manuscript, shows the handwritten edits. Because remember, it said that if you're going to publish this manuscript, you have to send it to the asbestos companies for them to edit. Even though Dr. Gardner died, Dr. Vorwald, as a Saranac Laboratory employee, was still bound by this. And also, he didn't want to annoy the people that were going to later pay him. What do we have that was changed? First, Paragraph number 75, you see the stuff that's scratched out? It says, the striking feature of the experiments was that nine out of 11 mice, 82% exposed for a year or more, showed pulmonary tumors, usually adenominous of type. Now, that word means it's a type of a tumor that is not a malignant cancer. This is what Vorwald is writing, that these are tumors, but they're not a cancer that's likely to metastasize. They're, you've heard benign, that's what this would be, is benign. So this is what one of the things that was written out, and I don't want you to think that these really were benign, you'll see that they weren't, but this is even what was attempted to be published. And then the next one, neoplasm, which means cancer. No specific experiment was conducted to determine whether the inhalation of asbestos determines cancer or, or leads to the development of cancer. The reason that no specific experiment was developed was because the industry wouldn't allow it. Gardner begged them for years, please let me do this study. No. So he said, this was recorded in the monograph by the late Dr. Gardner in February of 43. He called attention to the high incidence of lung cancer among the mice. Now, this is where 
Vorwald is trying to talk about the distinction. He's saying, hey, a cancer is a tumor, a neoplasm capable of local invasion and destruction of tissue. And an adenoma, on the other hand, is a so-called benign or malignant, uh, non-malignant tumor. So it may or may not be capable of metastasizing and turning into cancer. So even this watered down version saying, hey, these mice got these tumors that really weren't cancer, the asbestos industry wouldn't even let that out. Hmm, I wonder why. It's not because these cancers were completely benign, as you can see on this next slide. We have an article written by Dr. Garrett Sheppers, who worked at Saranac with Vorwald and Dr. Gardner. So he was there. And this is what he has to say. The handwritten lab notes and some of Dr. Gardner's slides have recently been found. Well, why have they only recently been found? Because when Vorwald left the laboratory, he stole all of the slides and material, except for a few, and never released them. But what has been found verified that the tumors he saw in the mice included truly malignant neoplasms. Since Dr. Gardner judged nine out of the 11 mice to have developed neoplasia or cancer, he calculated an incidence of 81.8%, which was six times more prevalent than the tumors usually encountered. He continues, if some lesser entity had written officially on finding 81.8% cancers in mice exposed to chrysotile dust, as Dr. Gardner did to Johns Manville in 43, far less attention might have been paid. But Dr. Gardner was the number one authority on pneumoconiosis animal research in the United States at the time. Remember, asbestosis is a type of pneumoconiosis. So this is the biggest guy in the country at the time. He'd been studying the experimental pathology of chrysotile for 24 years. The industries formerly accepted his word on all asbestos matters. It was only when cancer reared its ugly head in 1943 that they became frightened and backed off and refused further involvement. Because in 43, as you'll see, he wrote saying, hey, cancer is a problem. They would not have done so. They would not have backed off and been frightened for mere mouse adenomas. Dr. Gardner had effectively warned them that malignant neoplasia is a specific effect of inhalation of chrysotile dust. He goes on. Dr. Shepers, who was there, goes on. Did Dr. Vorwald discover that chrysotile caused lung cancer? He most assuredly did, both in mice and men. The fact that he never published anything on such an important matter may be a mystery, but not if one considers for almost three decades he served as a defense litigation expert for the asbestos industries. Now, you'll have to watch the video about Saranac Labs that we're making if you want to get the, some more details on this, but you'll notice how it says he discovered cancer in mice and men. Johns Manville's asbestos mine in Quebec, they had some people that were up to some very shady things. They did not want in any way, shape, or form the miners to discover the risks of asbestos and illness, or cancer, especially cancer. So a couple of their people up there, when people would get diagnosed, they stole the slides and the pathology reports and smuggled them away so that none of the, the treating doctors in the areas would ever know that people had cancer. So there were studies that were put out that said, oh, gee, look, minors have had no greater incidence of cancer than people in the surrounding community, so asbestos must be safe. Yeah, they did have a higher incidence, but the slides were stolen and hidden. That's the lengths that these people went to to conceal that the fact asbestos could cause cancer. And it's not just me who thinks that asbestos, the asbestos industry concealed this, and if, if they hadn't, we would have known sooner. There was a doctor, uh, a professor named Philip Enterline, who worked as a consultant for the asbestos industry for some time. He later saw the same monograph that I just showed you, the stuff that was crossed out, and he executed an affidavit in 1991. This is what he had to say. It's my opinion that if the Gardner findings of an 81.8% tumor incidence in mice exposed to asbestos had been published in a reputable scientific journal, it would have accelerated in this country the acceptance of a causal relationship between asbestos and cancer. Now, Answerline didn't agree that they discovered cancer. He took a little bit of a, of, of a disagreement with, uh, with Dr. Shepers there. But uh, he, he more felt that these were uh, non-malignant tumors. But even if they were, Professor Enerline here states that even just the publication that these mice were getting tumors would have accelerated the relationship. And he's right, because if Dr. Gardner, the world's foremost expert on pneumoconiosis, had said, I've been doing some, some work with asbestos and these mice are getting tumors, other researchers would have gotten in the game. 
that's part of how they wanted to control is to make sure that other researchers wouldn't do work. So for years, the asbestos industry kept hyping up Gardner study that was supposed to be forthcoming. Don't worry, guys, we're doing the biggest, best asbestos study in the world. And when it comes out, you're going to know everything that you need to know. That was done to discourage others from trying to duplicate his work. What Dr. Gardner's work was, in essence, and I don't mean to denigrate him or simplify what he's doing by saying this, is it was simple. They took mice, they put them in a, in a room, they pumped asbestos dust in there for 24 hours a day, and then they cut them open and checked them out. Very complicated work that not anybody could do, but it's not like the asbestos industry couldn't have funded this. They had their own laboratories, and it's not like other medical researchers couldn't have bought some mice and kept them alive for a couple of years before they cut them open. They just didn't think there was a point in doing it, because if you're told the preeminent pneumoconiosis expert in the world is doing this study, and you're a young five-year out of medical school researcher, you're not going to try to duplicate his work. You're going to wait for his work and then try to build off of it. And if those studies had been done, what would have happened is the relationship would have been accelerated. They didn't want those studies done. But just like we talked about earlier, if you hear weird noises in your car and you don't want to deal with it, so you just turn the radio up, this is them turning the radio up. They don't want to know because otherwise people will come to the conclusion, like their expert witness, Professor Enterline did, was that if you'd done this published, if this information had been published, more studies would have been done and the world would have discovered far sooner that asbestos can lead to lung cancer. So when did the world discover that? Let's talk now about uh, lung cancer and asbestos. In part three of the video, we did an in-depth dive on lung cancer's relation to asbestos and we borrowed a few of these slides. So if you want to know more on this topic, watch part three of the video. But this textbook, The Pathology of Asbestos-Associated Diseases, is an industry standard, super reputable textbook. And the authors of this book write, the first report of carcinoma of the lung in an asbestos worker was that of Lynch and Smith in 1935, a squamous carcinoma in a patient with asbestosis. In 1943, Homburger reported three additional cases of bronchogenic carcinoma associated with asbestosis, bringing the world total reported to that date to 19 cases. 1943 is highlighted for a reason, and here it is. In February of 24th of 1943, Dr. Gardner wrote to Vandiver Brown, and he wrote, The question of cancer susceptibility now seems more significant than I'd previously imagined. Of 11 mice inhaling long fiber asbestos for 15 to 24 months, eight developed malignant tumors in their lungs, and six of them had tumors in other organs. The incidence rate, 81.8%, is excessive. So 1943, Vandiver Brown got a letter from Dr. Gardner, the expert, saying, hey, cancer susceptibility is a much bigger question than I previously thought. I've got eight out of my 11 mice here have cancer. Vandiver Brown wants nothing to do with it, ignores it. Next from the book. In his annual report from 1947 as chief inspector of the factories in England and Wales, Dr. Merriweather noted that among 235 deaths attributed at autopsy to asbestosis, 13% had a lung or pleural cancer. Well, this is how these coincidences work out, because in 1947, again, Vandiver Brown sends a letter to Manfred Bowditch, who works at Saranac. At this time, Dr. Gardner had passed away, and when he passed away, Bowditch sent out, hey, this is some of the stuff that Gardner had been working on, we're going to figure out where to go from here. And now this is really interesting to me because Vandiver Brown writes, I'm very much concerned by paragraph number four indicated by you as one of Dr. Gardner's notes. None of his interim reports, so far as I recall, had ever indicated any such abnormal incidence of lung cancer in the experimental animals. We've already seen in 1943, he was informed about it. So I'm unsure at this point, is Vandiver lying or did Vandiver not really read the other letter? I'm not 100% on this either way. It could have been that he was hoping that Bowditch didn't know and he's trying to play, what do you mean cancer? I, I never heard about this. Or maybe he was asleep at the wheel when the 1943 report came in and he had other stuff going on and just skipped it. We don't know. What we do know is you can see at the bottom where it says BLDCC, this is the original blind carbon copy. Back in the day when they had to use carbon paper, which would copy things through and you could have a copy where you would type stuff out and only your recipient would see it, but the others wouldn't. 
What he did is he blind carbon copied J.P. Woodard, who was an industrial relations guy at, uh, at Johns Manville, and he wrote, the finding referred to looks like dynamite. Yeah, the finding that your product causes lung cancer would absolutely be dynamite. And a reputable company, a reasonable company, would would look and decide, we need to investigate this dynamite. We need to see if there's something there and do follow-up studies. But they didn't. So this is a letter that he received from, from Manfred Bowditch. I'm very much concerned by paragraph number four. I don't remember anything with cancer before. Bowditch writes him back. The points with regard to lung cancer and experimental animals to which you refer were taken from page eight of an outline of proposed monograph on asbestosis dated February 1943, which was forwarded to you by Dr. Gardner on February 24th of 43 and acknowledged by you on March 1st with the comment that photostats were being made for distribution to the several interested companies. One of the many missing documents in the asbestos litigation is whatever Vandiver Brown wrote back on March 1st. I'm still trying to find that letter. But we know for certain that Vandiver Brown got that monograph that had the information about the 82% mice having tumors, and he made copies of it and sent it to everybody else. That was in 43. It wasn't until 1955 that people recognized asbestos could cause cancer. That in 1955, Sir Richard Dahl published his classic study, which was the first systematic combined epidemiological and pathologic study of lung cancer among asbestos workers. Dahl concluded that carcinoma of the lung was a specific industrial hazard of asbestos workers. 1955 is when the medical profession was really put on notice. Exposure to asbestos can cause lung cancer. But they could have known by 1943 if Vandiver Brown and the rest of the crew funding the Saranac Laboratories had taken the gag off of Leroy Gardner's mouth. Dr. Gardner was desperate to tell the world, but the industry was desperate to silence him, and they did. How many lives were lost because of that gap in knowledge? At least Dr. Dahl got his report out, right? It's a very good thing. But even Dr. Dahl's report was tainted by the asbestos industry, and let me show you how. Now, Barry Castleman is an asbestos historian who is an expert and just knows so much about this. He's been doing it for decades and was some of the one of the persons who broke some of these original stories. So I want to make sure credit goes to him for the groundbreaking work that he did. And he wrote the article that's on your screen about Richard Dahl's uh, 1955 study on cancer. Now, originally, Dahl wanted to write, insufficient data are available to determine whether the excess cancer risk has yet been eliminated by the improved conditions which now exist. But his corporate master, which was Turner and Newell, who was actually kind of the Johns Manville of England, they were the largest asbestos company in England, and Johns Manville was the largest one in the U.S., He worked with Turner and Newell to do this study, and because he worked with them, they had some editorial control, not as much as Gardner. So he then, Dahl, wanted to modify that. How about this? The risk has become progressively less as the duration of employment under the old dusty conditions has decreased. It's unlikely that the risk is now large, but insufficient data are available to determine whether it's been completely eliminated. Even that one, they said no. This is what he ended up with. The risk has become progressively less as the duration of employment under the old dusty conditions has decreased. So you see it here. The first two rejected versions of the manuscript had the phrase insufficient data. Even the second version, it's unlikely the risk is now large. That's not good enough because it still says insufficient data. What does insufficient data mean? It means you just don't have enough information. So what do you do? You want to get more information. Getting more information is exactly what these companies don't want the world to have because that will put them on notice that their products are dangerous, they're killing people, and it triggers legal liability. By making these very minor changes, just removing the phrase insufficient data, that discourages other individuals from running studies. Manipulated data and they hid data. And I wanted to leave you guys with the people that are really, truly responsible. This is the 1936 Memorandum of Agreement in which the companies came together and agreed to fund Dr. Gardner's experiments as long as they got to keep them quiet. And when Mr. Bowditch informed uh, Vandiver Brown that not only did you get the letter in 1943, you forwarded the study to everyone else, every company on your screen got that. Everyone in 1943 at the company, at the executive levels, They received this because they had to approve signing it. So in 1943, people from every one of those companies on your screen were put on notice that asbestos could cause lung cancer, and every one of them chose to remain silent. 
That's how the conspiracy worked, at least in the 30s. And in future videos, we'll cover the things that happened later on and are still going on to this very day. But I hope today you'll understand that the asbestos industry had known for decades how deadly their products were, and they chose to hide the dangers and to spend great deals of money and great amounts of energy to keep those dangers hidden. And the saddest part of all is it worked. They were able to sweep this under the rug for decades, and hundreds of thousands of people died that should not have died, that did not get the warnings to wear the proper respiratory equipment, developed cancer, or developed other fatal diseases, because these companies made the decision to protect their profits as opposed to the lives of their workers and their customers. I appreciate you watching, and I hope you'll tune in for part five, the final part, where we're going to talk about the compensation that is available to individuals who have been injured by asbestos. Thank you.